Hi, welcome back to another post-coronavirus sociological theory lecture. This is the fourth in the series of lectures on Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. We'll get through the remaining sections of imperialism and try to get as deep into totalitarianism as we can uh, in this recording. Um, so let's begin. So, so the Arendt's chapter um, opens, um, this is the section on continental imperialism, uh, the pan movements. This is the single worst hand-drawn image of Europe you're ever going to see. Um, but, but I just, we'll just sort of begin, you know, she, she argues that ultimately, um, you know, uh, to a degree, uh, you know, Wilhelmian, um, uh, World War One German, um, um, activity, but certainly Nazism is linked to the pan-German movements of, uh, the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And Bolshevism is linked to the uh, pan-Slavic uh, movement. So, so really, Hitler and Stalin, the two main sort of what uh, Führers or leaders of totalitarian regimes um, in the early and mid 20th century, uh, are, are both following the logic of continental imperialism. So, what that means is, is that instead of doing, um, you know, the, the the kind of overseas imperialism, where a nation state is um, in essence, right, we did this last time, where, where a nation state is um, expanding outwards by, by linking up with territories elsewhere, Britain probably uh, the primary example of that. Uh, you know, we're we finding overseas territories, the expansion into Africa, the, the, the uh, scramble for Africa that we talked about last time, another example. But the pan movements are different because they work inside of the nation state. So as we talked about last time, once you begin to expand outward from one uh, nation state into its neighbors, um, you, you have a different logic. And she believes that it sets up, uh, I think, something like totalitarianism more, more completely. So again, sort of the pan-Slav movement is going to begin with Russia moving outwards uh, from here, right? And then you have the pan-German movement uh, moving outwards uh, as well. Alsace-Lorraine um, moving into Poland and, and, um, and other regions as well. And then, you know, the, Bal the, the, uh, the Balkans are certainly involved here with the pan-Serb movement and so on. So again, a really, really horribly drawn map. But, but just get a sense of this, that, that this is imperialism that's continental. It's tied to, um, to the uh, homeland, actually, right? So, um, so World War I is really linked to this, that pan movements underlay, the war machines. Uh, they provide the ideology, both for uh, the World War I um, uh, efforts, and then, you know, wind up becoming really involved in the propaganda, both for uh, Nazism and, um, and Bolshevism uh, later, right? So again, the German and the Slavs, these are both continental peoples with continental states, and they're seeking colonies directly on the continent and trying to expand outward from a, a, an already existing center of power. So in Carl Schmitt's terms, there, these continental movements are following the nomos of the land or the nomos of the earth, in which, um, as opposed to the nomos of the sea. So the nomos or the, um, the, the order of the earth that, that you have a people who's tied to a place, who's tied to a, a set of land, a set of territory that has an already established um, order to it, right? That their peasants are laid out in the land, um, that, you know, who are working the land. There are aristocratic overlords already laid out in the land. And that these, um, that, that, that constitutes a kind of structure or order or almost uh, again a nomos uh, that that um, that has a kind of precedence over um, and, and that is fundamentally it has a precedence over foreigners and it has a link uh, between the again the blood of the people and the soil of the earth right. So that the peasants that work the land, the blood is intermixed with the soil, right? And that there's a kind of overlay uh, between these things. Okay, so continental states expand outward following a logic that's distinct from uh, those uh, that expand uh, overseas. Okay, so continental imperialism then, uh, she argues, follows the logic of the pan movements, right? Uh, trying to reunite uh, um, uh, uh, territories. 
and that's different from overseas imperialism. So again, here we have um, uh, her argument would be that overseas imperialism tends to be economic, right? It tends to follow the logic of sort of primitive accumulation. We talked about that last time, um, where you have a kind of superfluous capital and superfluous land uh, of people that are going in search of 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 territories to conquer in order to primarily launch um, to prevent an accumulation crisis of capital and to try to uh, acquire, um, you know, sort of rapid profit. And, um, and that this is distinct from the pan movements, right? Uh, and her argument is that because there is no geographic distance separating the uh, imperial power from the territories that they're conquering, right? Uh, they have shared borders, that the methods that are going to be deployed um, are going to immediately rebound back upon uh, the nation uh, that begins the imperial struggle. In other words, her arguments before about the kind of the rebound effect or the boomerang effect of, of, of overseas imperialism, that this effect takes place almost immediately, right? Because, again, because the, the, uh, the colonial administration is right there visible to the nation itself. So continental imperialism then begins at home, she says, uh, and it always is linked to an, involve, an enlarged tribal consciousness, something like tribal nationalism, she's gonna call it, that unites all people of similar volk, of a similar uh, uh, a, a demos, a similar way, a similar uh, a blood, that kind of thing. Natives in the truest sense of, of people who are, who are born and are linked together. So continental imperialism then is distinct from the overseas empire that has a more economic capitalist orientation, um, you know, capitalist adventures, financiers, and so on, much, and, 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 and to, even though she argues it's ultimately destructive of a nation state, there is a capacity for a nation state to endure overseas expansion more readily than those that expand uh, continentally. Okay, so on page 224, the race concept, race thinking, enthusiastic race thinking, thinking linked to the pan movements um, was really a widespread prior in, in continental imperialism. Um, so it wasn't economics, but politics that was involved in the pan movements and was involved in continental imperialism. Okay, not economics, but really politics, again, in a kind of enthusiasm. Free professions, teachers, um, um, lawyers, civil servants, you know, that, that, that was a variety of people who were involved in it. This is important because she's going to be making the argument that just as in anti-Semitic parties that were trans-class, these imperialist movements were also trans-class, right? So it's, so whenever you get imperialism, especially continental imperialism, you're going to be transcending the politics of class, you know, of, of bourgeoisie, proletariat, labor versus capital, and so on, and you're going to be into this politics of essentially race, okay? Okay, so uh, again, this is hostile to the nation state. The mood is um, more directly anti-state, right? So because, again, in the nation state, that kind of that tension between the two terms nation state, uh, this kind of tribal nationalism you're going to be expanding outside of state boundaries. It's a disconnection from the nation and the state. So it's always going to be a kind of anti-state logic. And she's going to make that claim uh, throughout. In fact, from here on through the rest of the book, um, um, these pan movements are anti-state movements. Totalitarianism is an anti-state movement, as we're going to find. Right? Okay. So this is not uh, class. Um, it, it's really... Um, yeah, so it's not linked to, to class. It's really about, um, you know, the ideology of, of race and movement. Okay, so racism is always at the core of pan-continental movements. Um, skin and soul are linked together here, a kind of a mystic soul. There is a mob, a kind of a populist mob held together by mood, not by sort of formal aims or formal program. Again, there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of enthusiasm, mob enthusiasm associated with the pan movements. Vague, again, goals, but much emotion, right? Okay, so they're movements almost more than, 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 than classes, that kind of thing, pan movements, okay. 
So they usually uh, depend upon the initiative of the mob and are led by mob intellectuals. So remember her argument was is that the overseas uh, um, empires were often led by capital or by promoters and, and, and you know, followed by a kind of a mob of scum of the earth, as she calls them, scum of all classes. The pan movements are really initiated by a mob and by mob intellectuals, and then capitalists really only get involved later, okay? So Germany, again, the pan-Germanic movement, uh, again, Germanized Central Europe is the goal. Again, ultimately, she's going to argue world domination is going to be a goal as well and begin to the totalitarianism phase of this. In Russia, is pan-Slavism, Russianized Eastern Europe, right? Uh, again, with world uh, uh, domination as as a goal. So again, the pan-Slav movements is really going to be Eastern Europe. Pan-Germanic movements are going to be uh, Central Europe. Okay, all right. And um, yeah, so tribal nationalism again is then distinct from Western uh, state nationalism, right? Much more emphasis upon a mystical soul and a kind of blood tie between a a a, a, a national native people and the soil upon which. Um, they have historically um, settled. Okay, page 226, she writes about Polish nationalism, like the true Pole shares similarities wherever the Pole might be, right? So Polishness then becomes a kind of mystical or even a blood-based possession of all Polish people. She talks about, again, a kind of Hegelian phrasing of this in terms of the Polish genius. Uh, page 227, um, extra... Um, yeah, see, this is a kind of extroverted, um, um, yeah, Western, uh, yeah, yeah, national, yeah, right, right. And there's kind of a, instead of the chauvinism of the nation state, you wind up with a kind of introverted Eastern Central European tribal consciousness. Okay, so uh, she's distinguishing on page 227 between Western and Eastern uh, nationalism. One really vo focused more on the nation state, the West, versus these, this sort of the tribalism um, the nation uh, in the East. Okay, so, um, yeah, so there's non-existent but mythic tribalism uh, concentrated upon individual soul and become and becoming the embodiment of tribal genius, right? That that's in this, this, this tribal nationalism. Um, there's a tremendous arrogance that goes on for those who are associated with these pan movements. Um, they tend to exalt uh, the inner qualities, right? While uh, while rejecting visible actual states, so again, it's the it's the mystical blood of the nation versus the administrative apparatus of the state, and because it's crossing state boundaries as a super state, it's always going to um, again be 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 tribal and trans state. Okay. So it's kind of a paranoid structure here. And I want to emphasize that throughout, both in her discussion of continental imperialism and in the discussion of totalitarianism. You're going to keep finding a kind of paranoia, right? Tribal nationalism. One is surrounded by enemies, right? One against all, right? Our people, our nation against all. People who are unique, who are special, who are incompatible and cannot be absorbed into something like common humanity right, uh, without loss. So in, in, in traditional sort of, you know, like French, uh, you know, or maybe even British, a nash, nation state nationalism, post-enlightenment nationalism, you're going to get this notion of common humanity, of humanity in general, and that the nation isn't really a nation of blood, it's a nation of laws, or it's a nation of, of sort of, you know, enlightenment, um, uh, um, you know, reason, that's not relevant here. This is a kind of downshifting out of the Enlightenment backwards into, again, a notion of tribe, of uniqueness, of something special, an almost mystical or religious sensibility about a common, um, um, uh, that we're not, we're not part of a common humanity, but we are a race apart. So it's fundamentally race thinking here. So you're trying to unite all people who share a blood, who share a soul, right? Uh, and to pull them away from those who are different. So it's not an enlightenment nationalism, but much more rooted in, again, blood and soil. So compare that to like Klaus Tavelite, you know, the fear of the, of the, um, of the morass, of the mire, of the swamp, um, you know, the, the, the undifferentiated common humanity, that kind of thing, uh, is common among kind of right nationalists, right, in the early 20th century. 
people are uh, the people are not the mob. The mob thinks that it is above the people as the Volk, as leaders of the Volk. So you're getting in this, this sort of this tribal nationalism, a desire to raise oneself up above common humanity, to be united with other people who share our unique qualities and not sink into, again, the common morass of, of, of undifferentiated humanity. So page 227, tribal nationalism, tribal nationalism then under continental imperialism again frustrations of those without nation states uh you know the remnants of of nations under the denomination of a foreign state like especially in the middle um seeking emancipation uh, are united with others as well so so under the Habsburgs you know uh you know the, the remnants of the Habsburg empire within the Austrian Hungary Hungary uh, uh, um, uh, regime you have multinational um, representation, but many resentments because, again, you're underneath the central state apparatus. So in, you know, the Austria-Hungarian uh, um, Empire, you've got many nations without formal nation-state recognition submerged under the central state apparatus of the, um, you know, of the empire. And the same with, with Tsarist Russia. So um, tribal nationalism, page 220, 227, is linked to irredentism, which refers to like the unredeemed uh, parts of territory that one has lost, which one wants to recover. So irredentist movements seek to recover lost territory. And so that's going to be part of pan-Germanism, that there were parts of, 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 um, of, of you know, the Holy Roman Empire that Germany used to, uh, would have been united with at one point, and there's a desire to be reunited with that. Um, so the pan-Slav and the pan-German movements are irredentist movements trying to reunite lost territories. So the disintegration of the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire, the remnants of it, is viewed as a means to achieve both pan-Slavism and pan-Germanism because of uh, these territories, right, like the... the, the um, Austro-Hungarian Empire is located, you know, in between these two states. And so to recover uh, Slavic peoples that are embedded within um, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially like, like Serbia or um, the, um, and, and the Germanic peoples as well, like the Austrians themselves are um, to be reunited back into um, a pan-German empire. Okay. So the pan movements are anti-state, anti-government, and really seeking to disintegrate this empire. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire, already weak, is going to be attacked uh, really from both sides by these pan movements. Okay, to split off and to re-merge. Page 228. So nationalism then is often checked at the border, right? Strict nation-state nationalism. However, these pan movements spill over the border. So they're going to be fundamentally disruptive. So these are images of, um, there's a whole bunch of these, of, of, with the same idea, these maps of Europe uh, at, the, at the beginning of the Great War, Great War that show these different empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia, Germany, um, you know, Italy, France, that are all sort of um, armed to the teeth and looking to expand. So Russia is looking to move into and to reacquire ter territories uh, to reunite the Slavic peoples, Germany the same way. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire, again, is right in the middle uh, of this with, again, like the Balkans, um, really, you know, um, sort of absolutely at play here, right? So, um, yeah, so Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, Bosnia, um, you know, being carried away, uh, you know, by, by Austria, Hungary, right? Russia trying to expand in, um, you know, Germany trying to expand, that kind of thing. So all of these images of these pan movements seeking to expand out. So because the pan movements are going to be crossing over the borders of already existing nation states, again, war is inevitable and they're going to be fundamentally disruptive uh, agents. Now, the reason that this matters so much to Arendt is because warfare is going to create, uh, and especially warfare that's aimed at uniting nations, racialized nations. It's going to create all kinds of racial minorities 
and all kinds of refugees, especially in the wake of the war, which is going to further destabilize Europe and is going to lead to these totalitarian movements of mid 20th century. So yeah, so uh, anti-Semitism winds up getting reignited by pan movements um, who see Jewish peoples and Jewish interests allied with the nation states, especially like those that stand above uh, uh, the nation because Jewish people aren't of the nation, but they tend to be attached to the state, right? As state bankers and so on, or diplomats. Uh, again, they tend to be associated with the state, not the nation, and um, yeah, and are, and are international. So the pan movement then um, is, is a kind of, yeah, nationalism, outside of the nation state, looking for leadership or admiring leadership outside the nation state. So uh, Austrians admire, you know, like Bismarck and so on, right? So, you, so again, it's a strange thing. You're located as a German within Austria and you're looking outside of Austria into Germany for political leadership. Okay, so Jews become avatars then, uh, Jewish people for non-tribal states, uh, for foreign oppressors blocking a return uh, to tribal reunion. So Jewish people, again, become a kind of um, shorthand for a centralized state administration that doesn't fully reflect the interest of the tribalized nation, the, you know, the, the racialized nation. So pan-Germans regard anti-Semitism as the mainstay of our national ideology. She quotes it on page 228, page 229. Anti-Semitism emerges as the creation at the center of a whole outlook on life and um, in the world in tribal nationalism. Okay, so anti-Semitism is always bound up in that. So on page 229, um, I'm giving myself directions to quote. Okay. Yeah, so there it is. The clue to the sudden, to the sudden emergence of anti-Semitism at the center of a whole outlook on life in the world that's distinguished from its mere political role in France during the Dreyfus Affair, or its role as an instrument of propaganda in the German Stecker movement, lies in the, in the um, nature of tribalism rather than the political facts and circumstance. The true significance of the pan movements anti-Semitism is that hatred of the Jews was for the first time severed from all actual experience concerning the Jewish people, right? Uh, political, uh, political, social, or economic, and followed only the peculiar logic of an ideology. So it becomes something that's very disconnected from experience and becomes an external imposition. Okay, uh, that doesn't seem particularly telling. <laughs> Sorry, I quoted that. It, but, but okay, so Jews then are the um, despised, um, um, yeah, the despised representatives of the nomos of the sea, the traitors, the people who seek difference, the people who are tolerant, the people who are willing to uh, uh, be surrounded by people of difference and so on. Um, and, and that becomes hated by the nomos of the earth, those who seem to reestablish a kind of conservative uh, um, world of, of tribal or racial unity. So this is in Schmidt's terms again, that the Jewish people are the ultimate people of the sea, right? So this is again, differences between tribal nationalism um, and, and continental imperialism versus yeah, uh, the typical um, nationalism of European nation states and the um, international um, imperial empires of, of the sea, right? Okay. So the demos then, consciousness of the people, um, popular, represented, yeah, so the demos then has all of these qualities again, and that this is going to be distinct from uh, the tribal nationalism um, that um, Arendt is going to be analyzing here. So page 237, pan movements, totalitarian movements are always anti-state. Uh, based upon national and racial interest over state interest. Okay, so again, it's the nation, not the nation state. So pan-Germanism, page 238, uh, she writes about Scherer. Um, Anti-Semitism results from an enlarged tribal consciousness of Germans and of Slavs and who use the, Ger the Jewish people as an archetype of nation, um, 
nation as tribe without state and territory. So the pan movements claim, oh yeah, this is the competition between the different tribes who view themselves to be, um, um, who, who each seek uh, a claim to be chosen by God or to be a chosen people, the chosen people status. So Jewish national historical theological claims um, to being a chosen people a people who lack a state, but who nevertheless maintain a national identity, right? A kind of tribal or racial identity is something that the Germanists and the Slavs envy. So there's the dual ethic of Judaism uh, is both envied and resented. The fact that we are a people with a kind of, of ethic of brotherhood and an ethic of, 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 um, of racial identity coupled with um, an a willingness to interact with those outside, that this is, both, again, both envy and, and resented, the capacity to maintain tribal consciousness among um, uh, Jewish people. So page 241, anti-Semitism then is kind of a group narcissism of pan movements driven by envy, uh, feeble-minded resentment of Jewish, uh, uh, claims of Jewish chosenness. Um, yeah, so totalitarianism then is kind of a perversion of religion. There's a theological element here in which a, uh, the, the, the idea that, that Jews are the chosen people becomes demonized, right? That the Old Testament claims, um, yeah, again, it's this worry that the Jewish people are going to take their place, right? This kind of psychotic, paranoid worry um, among, among the pan-Germans and the pan-Slavs that Jewish people in their midst are going to take their place, that their position in the state is actually already taking uh, their place, right? So page 243, Weber on bureaucracy and Schmidt on dictatorship is talked about. Very interesting section here. How the nation state, the rule of law, of, of legislation, of kind of bureaucratic regulation, a nation of consent, of representative governance and so on. All of this is rejected in the pan movements, and you wind up with a kind of emphasis upon Schmidtian dictatorship, in which the nation becomes ruled by extra legal dictators, or at least the dictates of extra legal dictates uh, by executive decree of a sovereign dictator who is above the law, right? In Schmidt's terms. So the nation state winds up voided in the pan movements who are seeking to, again, kind of create a, um, uh, to, to transcend nation state logics in order to um, uh, bond together the nation under a dictator. So the centralized states, um, like, again, the Austro-Hungarian state, had functioned this way, as had the colonial um, administrators that we talked about in the previous chapter, that they were essentially administrating by decree, less so by law. And um, yeah, so so what you're seeking here is a kind of rule by bureaucracy, by decree. Um, the czar's rule of Russia, um, unlimited essentially by law, um, free to declare, right, to make decrees, to dictate. So you're looking for a kind of a nation of movement with a decree of dictators as the mechanism for governance as opposed to consensual law. Okay, man, that was a long section to get to a really simple point, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, page 250, multi-party political systems um, versus the United States and Britain. That two-party systems, uh, Arendt argues that the multi-party parliamentary uh, structures are much more vulnerable to the pan movements and totalitarian takeover, um, basically because it's easier to essentially assemble a, um, a party above parties, right? So I'm, God, I had skipped all this, hadn't I? Um, you know, one of this didn't make any sense. Um, okay, so let's skip back to page 230. The problems of the European nation state. The congruence, yeah, God, I needed to do this. Um, okay, so on page 230, she argues that, that the European nation state has a kind of, there's three sort of elements that all have a congruence 
and are relatively clear. You have a people, you have a state, and you have a territory. The people, uh, or the demos, or the nation, have a kind of mystical commonality. They have a shared origin, uh, they're tribal, shared blood. The state is the uh, institutional arrangement that guarantees rights, sovereignty, and so on. And then the territory, again, is, um, is, is, is the soil, the settlement, the patterns of settlement. So the European nation state, the state is going to be congruent with the people and the territory, right? The blood and the soil, the state, nation state rooted in blood and soil. So nationalism elevates the concept of the nation, right? The blood, the romanticized soul over the state or the territory. So this is clearest in multinational states like Austro-Hungary and Tsarist Russia, where the state is viewed as something separate. It's a centralized administration of military and police and so on, a monopolization of violence that mediates the class conflict uh, within capitalism, and then often mediates the play of nations against each other within um, the territory, right? So in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the central administration negotiates between, say, you know, uh, Serbs, Croats, and so on, right? And between uh, the, the classes and capitalism. So that logic then in nationalism, this new form of, of trans state or, or, or tribal nationalism, native citizens um, receive citizenship from the nation, the blood, the soil, and naturalized citizens who receive their citizenship from state decree, you know, go through a process to become naturalized, you migrate, you go through a process to become naturalized, and so on. Um, in, in nationalism, the natives who are born have precedence over the naturalized citizens who are made national by the state, right? That the nation of blood and soil trumps that of the state. So peasants and serfs are sort of the ultimate carriers of blood and soil. That connection is strongest. And that, that continental logic, the nomos of the earth, right? The logic of the earth, the settlement patterns of the earth, the blood of the peasants who has been poured into the soil of the earth, right, is in purest form. So the belt of mixed peoples in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and in Tsarist Russia, the Balkans and so on, um, they don't really have a nation state. It's a mixed territory with arbitrary boundaries and so on. And this is kind of a, a, a kind of a breeding ground of tribal nationalism. Anti-state, irredentalist desire to recover territory, to reside again in a racially or nationally purified uh, territory, to reconstruct the states to better align uh, with the nations that exist within them. So page 233, then you get a political theology. This is what I'm trying to hint at in the other section. Uh, you get a chosen people or a nation in the Judeo-Christian tradition, very common, and that uh, racism is often linked to this kind of theological nationalism. One nation, one race chosen by God to rule, right, over all others. And that in the pan-Germanism and pan-Slavic, again, the German people, you're not just trying to reunite the German people to rule themselves, but then you're going to go global. Same with the pan-Slavic movement and so on, right? So these are fundamentally anti-liberal, um, anti-enlightenment movements, uh, rejecting universal rights and universal equality. They have contempt for these ideas, not love for them, and contempt for neighbors even. Anyone who's different in race, different in nativism, and so on, has contempt. So I'm supposed to quote page 235 here. Um, yeah, this great idea here about... Um, um, so, so this is the quote on page 41, or on page 235, quote 41, or footnote 41. We know our own people, its qualities and its short kind. Mankind we do not know, and we refuse to care or get enthusiastic about. Where does it begin? Where does it end? That we are supposed to love because it belongs to mankind in general. So it's a rejection here, these pan movements, of the notion of humanity, men in general, humans in general. Are the decadent or half bestial Russian peasant of the mirror, the Negro of East Africa, the half breed of German Southwest Africa, or the unbearable Jews of Galicia and Romania, all members of mankind? One can believe in the solidarity of the Germanic peoples. Whoever is outside the sphere does not matter to us. Okay? So, this idea 
again, of, of a rejection of enlightenment notions of, of humanity and of a nation state based on laws and, and shared faith and so on. Okay, so we're going to jump ahead now to 250 then. So the party system that was aligned with class interests, um, labor, business, uh, the aristocratic state, and so on, or uh, aristocratic landowners, the party above parties uh, emerges instead. And this is why, getting back to the previous note, it was a little bit out of order, is that the um, in a two-state system, a two-party state, a two-party system like Britain, um, it was harder for a state, a party above parties, a nationalist, racist party of parties, imperialist party of parties, to emerge and to gain power. But it was easier in a in a parliamentary system, a parliamentary state with many parties, right, where it was easy to find a party or to pull together a mass outside the current party system, a party above parties that is organized often through imperial and anti-Semitic campaigns. You create a movement, uh, a party, a movement party, a mass party instead of a class party, right? I'm going to skip that. Totalitarian movements then are not just a party of a parties, she argues, but are nationalist movements against the state. Something to be paying attention to here as we go. Okay, so again, the multi-party systems are particularly vulnerable to this. So you're pulling together the people outside of the existing party network who don't really fit the class structure, and they become the mass, the mob then that you're using to promote uh, tribal nationalism. Page 252, Anglo-American uh, system is contrasted to the continental system. Again, the state is above all parties in these systems, uh, even uh, even those forming a government. Yeah, so, so yeah, you get the state over, and above all parties, you have a conservative party representing aristocracy, a liberal democratic party representing the business class or capital. You get a labor party representing, uh, uh, um, you know, workers. Each of them has their own, uh, you know, ideologies, the ideology of blood and soil, possibly with aristocrats, or at least of, of peasant virtue, ideology of liberal markets for the business uh, uh, class, and kind of Marxist ideology or something for the labor parties. But these, but but the citizens and okay, yeah, this is it. So, but however, citizens and patriots often become detached from partisanship as such, and so um, the citizen, the patriot that's outside of the party system, becomes aroused or becomes uh, or that emerges in a state of warfare or a state of exception, where you get this enthusiastic patriotism that cuts across class lines, people fall out of the party structure or they they stop thinking primarily in terms of party and they become patriots right that kind of thing and so this is that patriotism as obedient self-oblivion she writes about on uh, in this section between 252 and 257. so everyone in during a state of exception was expected to be disloyal to party and to class interests and become absorbed in national con consciousness so again, these war machines and the push to war and the threat of war tends to drop people out of their class interest and the party linked to their class interest and make um, um, patriots or citizens available then for these uh, tribal nationalist movements. So totalitarianism then occurs when a dictatorship emerges um, outside, right? Yeah, where the state is above and outside parties um, and can be seized in a sovereign dictatorship of the nation directly, creating a movement state. Okay, so page 257 then, Mussolini's fascism is con contrasted to Hitler's totalitarianism. So with Mussolini in Italy, you had a fascist party above parties that seized and controlled the state. And this is the essence of fascism or authoritarianism is that the state is seized by an authoritarian or nationalist party. However, in Hitler's totalitarianism, the totalitarian Nazi movement viewed itself as above parties and above the state, so that the party was the organizational front of a movement um, that was uh, created um, 
that created essentially a movement state. So as we're going to find a totalitarianism, the existing state apparatus is essentially going to be negated, and you're going to get a movement state, a movement apparatus, right, that is going to be created alongside the existing state. So it's not a takeover of the state. It's really a takeover of society, and the state apparatus is essentially negated while a new party or really movement state is created. So in fascist Italy, again, the fascists took over the state. It was a state-loving or state-worshipping movement, whereas the Hitler's, Hitler's movement, the totalitarian Nazi movement, was a state, kind of a state-hating movement. So in fascist Italy, the army was taken over by the fascist, and the fascist army and the fascist state become the primary symbols of fascism as such. Fascists transferred, uh, transformed a multi-party state, took it over, transformed it to a one-party state uh, with dictator uh, a status. So it was still state-worshipping under one-party dictatorship. Hitler, at least this was prior to 1938, when it became uh, uh, totalitarian afterwards. Hitler's totalitarianism, again, the totalitarian Nazi movement was above both parties and the state. The army was actually destroyed or at least subordinated uh, to uh, paramilitary organizations, right, and political commissars, right, uh, Nazi party um, uh, uh, leaders. So the army and the state remained, but they were subordinated under, um, again, a kind of national movement. So the paramilitaries were created alongside of the existing army and eventually wound up um, kind of muddying the water. So the army remains but it kind of becomes under control of the uh, Nazi paramilitary uh, leadership. So Nazis bypass the state and the army, the SS, the SA, uh, the par party apparatus. This was a movement, not state worship. So you're worshiping the movement, the nation, the people. It's kind of a racial worship as opposed to state worship. Okay. All right. Um, so... Um, so you wind up with fascist authoritarianism then, state-loving, na national idolatry, love of the state apparatus, the party takes over and seizes the state and then merges with it. In Nazi totalitarianism, it's anti-state. There's a kind of nationalist antipathy, antipathy to the state, the deep state, and a uh, distrust of state apparatuses, again, the deep state. And so the movement creates the party, and the party creates a paramilitary and a parastate uh, series of organizations, paraprofessional organizations. Um, so the state is destroyed or at least negated or detuned or subordinated. Um, so classes become essentially destroyed and negated. Parties are essentially destroyed and negated. And the movement then obliterates all of this, obliterates classes under racial and tribal consciousness. Nationalism rises not classes, right? So it's a way to, Nazism and totalitarianism negates classes more fully and more completely than um, fascism does. And it's much more racial. It really wasn't, uh, fascism wasn't particularly na uh, racial, it was just simply national. All right, uh, page 262, movements increase power, have greater power and success than parties when they have um, anti-state because they're able to transcend parties and classes. So these tribal consciousness movement, imperialist movements, continental imperialist movements, have greater power because they're able to tap into um, people who remain outside of the existing class and existing party apparatus. Page 264, the Nazis then, their rise led to a polarization. Oh yeah, that as the Nazis rise to power, they wind up redistributing um, sort of positions taken by the remaining uh, political parties. And what happened was, is because the Nazis were so anti-state, most of the existing parties wound up being relatively state accommodations or pro-state, and you wound up getting this weird realignment of the parties, right? Kind of essentially destroyed the existing party network and re led to a very rapid state of exception uh, within Germany where you set aside the law. 
So chapter 9, that I'll do this really fast then, is, is the chapter that discuss, discusses the decline of the nation state and the rights of man. So it kind of follows on the same logic. Page 268, stateless peoples and minorities increase these legal ethnic minorities that have some sort of legal standing within nations increases after the war. And that this leads to further disintegration and further denationalization. So the war ended, and let me see, I have actually a map of this. So the war ends, and yeah, after the war, you have... Um, yeah, a relatively high percentage of populations in the former, uh, the subject nationality of the German alliance, right? So you have, um, like within, like Germans are distributed in Germany, Austria, and Hungary. Uh, you know, there's Danes exist in Germany, uh, Alsatians in Germany, right? Uh, the numbers there, uh, Czechoslovakians and Austrian Hungary here, that's kind of weird, that's there. Yugoslavs, um, exist in Austria, Hungary, and so on, Romanians, Italians, Greeks. So you get ethnic minorities existing all throughout the national. So after the war, national boundaries are redrawn by treaty, and that leaves um, some minority populations, ethnic minorities, outside of the nation. It creates something called state peoples, as she writes about, state peoples. Um, so these are... Uh, are um, are people who have dominance over the state, who are sort of the official sort of uh, carriers of the state. So you have state peoples and stateless peoples. And um, I don't know how to do this exactly. Yeah, so, so at any rate, you wind up getting an increase of, after the war, of people who are not in a nation state territory combination that fully represents them, right? So refugees wind up are as stateless people traveling from place to place. Uh, minorities are, again, are in a state, but they have kind of reduced status. So the blood soil tie of homogenous populations within a settled territory becomes uh, broken. And I don't know, I tried to create a little drawing of this. So again, you have people, state, territory. A nation state has, na has, has, Again, the people, the demos has all three of those. You get ra you get minorities, ethnic or racial minorities, ethnic minorities uh, within a state when they have been uh, when they've lost their states. So that would be number two. So it's people who are who are in a territory but don't have a state. So that would be minorities. Um, you have un unemancipated peoples who are in position three. So. They're in a state, um, right, and they're in the territory, but they, right, they, I guess they're in the same position here. They don't have a state. I'm trying to draw this. At any rate, um, refugees, stateless peoples, uh, Jew, Jewish people, all are in this position of not having all three of those um, points of the triangle of a people, a state, and a territory together. Okay. So then this leads um, to chapter 10, the first chapter in, um, in totalitarianism, uh, the chapter on uh, a classless society. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here, and we'll start that in, on the next recording.